engine. But uh, what is the electronic engine? The electronic engine, it is an engine without a camshaft. I don't know if you can imagine an engine without a camshaft driving your car. Eh? Sometimes it sounds a little bit tricky. So uh, no camshaft means no mechanical activation for the fuel injection and for the exhaust valve activation. So the question is, how is the fuel injection driven? How is the exhaust activation driven? And uh, the answer it is with electro-hydraulic wave. So we are using plenty of electronics in order to drive hydraulic equipment, plenty of hydraulic valves per cylinder in order to control fuel injection and exhaust valve opening. The second question that comes in my mind it is why the need an electronic engine? Why not continuing to the future with a camshaft engine? The question needs a double answer. And this double answer it is number one, emissions, and then number two, low load operation performance. So the first answer that has to do with the emissions, most of you may be already familiar, it is that uh, emissions from tier one to tier three, to tier two and now to tier three have gone uh, uh, have been uh, reduced the limitation for the emissions at around 80%. So nitrogen oxides, sulfur oxides. Uh, carbon dioxide and particulate matter are now of very low level and at the same time we need a very very rapid and a very very sharp profile of injection at the same time while market requests low low operation. The good thing with the electronic engine is that it's all low range, it is 100% adjustable. Maximum pressure corresponding to the fuel injection time. Compression pressure corresponding to the exhaust valve closing time. All kind of lubrication adjustments, plus also hydraulic pressure and power that it is taken out from the engine, it is 100% adjustable. So this gives a very, very high advantage to the engine in order to be adapted to new technologies that uh, will lead us to the tier 3 years. So, when I'm thinking about a two-stroke engine, one also question that comes to my mind here is how we can achieve limitation of the tier 3. And uh, one diesel, it is going forward into the future with two solutions. Catalytic reactor, where the exhaust gases are passing through and noxious and uh, sulfur oxides are getting much lower, plus carbon dioxide. The second way, it is exhaust gas recirculation. And the uh, exhaust gas, please come closer. And the exhaust gas recirculation, it is also taking care of a uh, new system that it is passing by an amount of exhaust gases and another amount it is passing again to be reburned into the cylinder. Because as you maybe know, in order to have the noxious to be high, we need remaining oxygen temperature to be high after combustion because there is no combustion and it is perfect. So the main mechanical reason for giving high temperatures after combustion, so high temperature of remaining oxygen after combustion, it is the compression pressure. Okay, so controlling the timing of the exhaust valve, it was critical for going to the tier 3 air. Okay, and uh, as you already know, with the camshaft, you cannot control and you cannot adjust the peak of the compression pressure. It is fixed according to the camshaft profile. Now, regarding the low load operation, which is the main second reason for moving from a, uh, from a conventional engine to a camshaft engine, it is that uh, market and uh, chartering market it is requesting less RPM less navigation speed and at the same time it is also requesting lower load specific fuel optimized condition and at the same time of course reduced consumption of cylinder oil. These engines can go up to 10% constant load forever and uh, if you try to, uh, to convert this from a load 
to frequency or to revolutions. Just imagine that per cylinder for these engines we can have the firing per nine seconds. So it is a boom and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, boom again. So 10% of course, provided that we are dry cleaning and we are water cleaning the thermocharger. We are doing a, a periodically scavenge port inspection to see how is the carbonization inside the engine. And once we are at least two days going and driving engine for at least two hours close to MCR in order all carbonization to get out from the funnel. So having an engine which is 100% adjustable on low load operation, it is one huge advantage. The second huge advantage, it is that when we are driving an engine with a camshaft, when we are driving the fuel pumps with a camshaft, the, the fuel pumps are pumping according to a profile which is not stable. That's why on the conventional engines, we were talking about performance to be received on 75% of load or even more. Because uh, the design principle of a two-stroke engine, remember, I don't know if anybody of you uh, has been involved uh, during his youth with a two-stroke motorcycle. Eh? Exactly. Plenty of you are smiling. So, uh, if you remember, when you are driving a motorcycle two-stroke, even if it is auto cycle and not diesel cycle, you have too much smoke on low load. And when uh, you were driving engine in very, very high load, then it was perfect. So this is the principle on the two-stroke, it is exactly the same. So when having a camshaft, you are pumping, so in low load, you do not have permanently constant pressures of fuel injection. That's why we also had deviations on the fuel injection timing on very, very low load. On this engine, we are not using the camshaft anymore, so we are using engine-driven pumps, which are stealing, let's say, an amount from the main lube oil pump delivery and they are giving boosting to the engines even in very, very low, low conditions. And this is a thing that has given, has given a huge advantage on the usage of the electronic engine. Now, what are the main differences in hardware? The main differences in hardware, they do not exist. Bed blade, it is still bed blade. Crankshaft, it is still uh, crankshaft. Main bearings, still main bearings. Piston rod, stuffing box, piston rings, and piston crowns, exhaust pumps. Main hardware of the two-stroke engine it is still the same. What has been changed through these years? Because this lady over here, it is not uh, so young. The design comes back from 1991, and uh, the uh, first, let's say, uh, introduction to the market, uh, it is since 2003. And during this whole time, too many things have been developed, too many things are still changing in order to have a reliable engine. Because when we are talking about a 1 BMW low speed two stroke engine, the first thing that comes in mind it is crossing the Pacific 30, 45 days nowadays with a low load operation, but without having a problem with the engine, because also our life depends on that. So what is the difference? First of all, the difference is in the philosophy. Philosophy of the operators must be a little bit uh, changed nowadays because uh, on a conventional engine when you had an issue, you were just uh, running down in the engine room and you were trying to troubleshoot. With this engine, first you have to troubleshoot through your eyes. If you don't troubleshoot through your eyes, then you cannot have a targeted troubleshooting action immediately. So running on the conventional engine down to engine room or running to your mops, it is one critical difference. Second critical difference, it is that now we have an electrical system, an electrical dust electronic system that it is taking care of controlling and of monitoring of every single component of these new engines. Firing timing, exhaust valve opening timing, exhaust valve closing timing, cylinder oil injection and amount, uh, hydraulics, and one thing that uh, it is really difficult when you think on that now it has been solved, it is optimizing the engine's condition to test bed levels. Because one main 
let's say, topic that uh, plenty of people are asking about or uh, we are receiving plenty of emails and questions. It is, what about the performance of the engine? It is the same. When we are talking about performance of a two-stroke engine, we are talking about balancing cylinder by cylinder according to the mean value of the whole engine. So the question is, what about the mean value? Is the mean value correct or it is not correct? And uh, with which value we are comparing the mean value of the engine in service? And the answer is straightforward and it is only with the test. So the engine now has an incorporated algorithm which is covering the whole load range together with an incorporated crankshaft model. And what we are doing now is that we can adjust also not cylinder by cylinder, but then all cylinders to test the level. What is this engine? Uh, uh, what is this engine telling to us? It is just take it easy, because when a new engine it is introduced in the market, and when you have to change the way of philosophy that we are thinking, sometimes you are a little bit afraid. Though that engine it is tested since 90s, and uh, this is one also main characteristic of one diesel. We are not getting out. Uh, we are not uh, uh, giving into the market. Uh, something that it is not tested yet a lot. Of course, developments will still uh, go and they are still on the run. For cylinder oil, for a consumption of uh, uh, fuel oil, uh, what is going on now with changing from uh, uh, low sulfur to high sulfur and all this stuff. Also adjustable 100% on this engine. What is uh, this engine uh, having as a new design? electronics and hydraulic power. When we are talking about electronics and when you are going to read about these engines or to study even a little bit further, you will uh, hear about something that it is called engine control system. An engine control system, when we are talking about engine control system, we are talking about three things. Not one million things. Three things. Thing number one, it is our eyes the way that we can adjust and we can monitor the engine. Thing number two, it is... a set of electronics that they are taking control of the main engine plus monitoring of everything. Of everything. I'm just stopping a little bit just for you to take a look. Because if you open all the other cabinets, they look exactly the same. Single rules 
and simple, single and simple at the same time. But uh, we can just have in mind in order to having the engine in perfect condition. Now, the event it is called uh, start the engine. So uh, we will uh, try. Now the engine is running. Uh, if we just take a small look to the engine control system, this engine control system it is, as you can see, a set of controllers. These two thick lines, A and B, is the networks that they are driving the intercommunication throughout the whole engine. And uh, of course, our monitors, main operating panel A and main operating panel B, in order to have uh, two monitors to check what is going on. So when we wish to observe what is going on to the engine when the engine is running, as you can see, somebody has given an engine control room command and this engine control room command it is filtered by a number of algorithms in order these algorithms to give confirmation and approval in order engine to apply this command that has been given for example let me show you from this screen so here you can see that uh, somebody who is giving an external system command engine control room telegraph giving rpm or bridge telegraph it is an external system okay it is not min system and it is speaking together with our governors which are now like motherboards governors are called now engine control units engine control unit a and engine control unit b two for redundancy so mechanical governors or uh, semi-electronic or fully electronic governors of the conventional engine are not existing anymore. Now, this is the governor. Okay, a multi-layered motherboard which is called multi-purpose controller. So when engine is running, you can see or when we give a different requisition, a number of algorithms for stabilizing thermal condition of the engine plus RPM, or uh, if we have a shaft generator, for power takeoff, which synchronizes only uh, within specific RPM of the uh, crankshaft. Or when we have a slowdown alarm and a slowdown reposition from the system because exhaust gas temperatures on cylinder number four, for example, they are sky high, they are deviated. So this will come from alarm monitoring system as a command down to these units. And these units, as you can see, they are called EICU. They are engine interface units. So the interface units, they are checking what you are requesting from the engine to do. And if everything is okay, they are giving this setting point of the switch, which is now safe for the, hard, for the hardware, to the next level of programming, which is the ECU, which is the governor. So now the governor is asking, am I during starting to increase fuel? Do I have any chief adjustment for reducing fuel pumps or fuel oil pressure boosters, we call them now, stroke? Do I have enough scavenge air pressure in order to keep the proper ratio between air and fuel and to increase the speed? Do I have the appropriate torque in order to increase the speed or I am thermally overloading the main engine? This happens, for example, when you are on a heavy running of a propeller, thermal overload of the engine. Do I have adequate hydraulic power supply? Do my pumps work properly in order to send the proper amount of hydraulic oil, of lube oil, high pressure, to our main hydraulic equipment and increase the load? And uh, do I have a turbocharger cut out the retrofit for increasing the efficiency of uh, the specific fuel oil consumption on specific uh, load or RPM ranges? So all these governors are checking, so uh, if everything is okay, they release the fuel index. They give okay to the hydraulics and to the fuel pumps to give the appropriate fuel in order our requisition to be fulfilled. If not, they are limiting the fuel index. One of the most important safety uh, parameters of the system, it is in here, it is incorporated in the governors. So, we have, let's say, two protective walls on this engine when we are giving a command. A protective wall coming from the interface units, checking all surroundings of the engine, if speed requisition is safe for hardware. And second, the protective wall 
which is protecting the thermodynamics of the engine. Okay, so let's say it is a two layers safety, both high hardware and thermodynamics. And of course, in order uh, to fulfill also the title of our, uh, uh, of our uh, event, what do we need to start the main engine? Air. We need compressed air from our bottles in order to give an air kick and a blow off of the main engine. We need jacket cooling, we need lube oil, we need fuel oil in circulation. And of course, with these engines now, we need hydraulic power, which means that uh, our startup pumps are working. Yeah, here you can see two startup pumps for starting the main engine and at least three engine driven pumps which are running on specific swash plate percentage to give the appropriate high pressure. So in this system it is incorporated also the load diagram and the layout of the engine. So when we give a requisition there is a calculation in the system. Ah, okay, so you need to go 65%. So the maximum pressure must be this 128 bar. The compression pressure must be 110. The exhaust valve opening timing must be 114 degrees. And uh, the speed setting point is 99.4 revolutions. And in order to achieve that, you need 209 bar from your pumps. So system it is also cross-checking itself all the time. And this is done with a rate of 0.5 milliseconds. This means 2,000 times per second, because we also need safety. Eh? If something goes wrong, we need to go for a slowdown. So monitoring, this is a good way in electronics, but about the electronics, it is always better to take advantage of the frequency that you can update the information that you take. Okay, so now you can see that uh, when we move handle, a little bit lower, all the parameters will change to the engine. 59% different pressure, different opening of the exhaust valve, different ratio between uh, peak comp and scavenger pressure, absolute value. Different hydraulic oil setting point from the pumps which is followed. Now it will be followed, can you see? So the pumps they are uh, taking care of the swash plate position according to the load requisition from the system and what about the controllers that you can see on your left yeah, on your right on my left it is you can see ACUs one two three units it is auxiliary control units which are taking care of the pneumatic maneuvering system of the engine of the auxiliary blowers because we need them uh, we always need them uh, for the engine to breathe initially at least and of course of the pumps that's why they are called auxiliaries then we have the governors that they are taking care of uh, protection of thermodynamics of the engine, uh, reading uh, constantly every single parameter. We have interface units that they are receiving signals from external systems, safety system, alarm monitoring system, remote controlling system, driving the engine from the bridge or from the engine control with telegraph. Local operating panel, it is still there and it is completely on your right. So you can still drive the engine locally for safety. And at the same time, <coughs> sorry, and at the same time, we also have the, uh, the CCUs and the CCUs they are on the side. Of course, this is just the, for space, a two-cylinder simulator. So it is CCUs. If you see the schematic drawing of this engine's brain, it is having only two cylinders, like the old school 1900 uh, engines. This is how the system looks like and how the system responds. And what about the cylinder control units? They are taking care of starting air per cylinder, fuel injection per cylinder, activation of the exhaust valve per cylinder, cylinder lubricators per cylinder. Okay? So every single component has its own function and the most important in this engine is also to train our brain to think like uh, this engine control system. Which means what? In, uh, just to make the long uh, story short, it is just being able to know 
when we are driving an engine like this, which are the functions that are hidden behind controllers. Because when you see, this is a screen, the operation screen, I will just point it in both screens. This is the screen that you are going to use the most when driving an engine like this. So, when you look at this screen, you can see plenty of stuff, but you can understand plenty more if you just know some critical information. For example, the main state of the engine, it is under the governors. So if you have an issue here, then uh, take a look to your MPCs of the governors. Speed modification, this is the speed setting point. Interface units, fuel index limitation, still the governors protecting the hydro, the, uh, the thermodynamics. Critical speed, what is going on with your starting air, with your inlet oil to your engine driven pumps, with the discharge pressure of oil for the engine driven pumps, what is going on with, with breathing of the main engine and the scavenge air pressure, and of course if your hydraulic power supply is in good condition and it is in auto, if your lubricators are running, if your auxiliary blowers are started or stopped, plus the mode, because the good thing it is that uh, you can drive also this engine on a manual way. You can uh, put, you can still put blowers into manual, and uh, you can still uh, drive the blowers locally. You can still drive the pumps locally for starting the main engine. And this is also a double and a triple or a quad safety factor for uh, having an engine that it is maneuverable and ready 100% always. So, if we wish to start the engine, let's stop it first. I will do it once. And uh, please, everybody I would like to try. We will stay here up to 7 o'clock. And we are loyal to what we say. So if you have questions, we are here to answer. And that's the main reason for the event. Either advanced questions or not, we are, uh, I think, the best group in the world to answer these questions. So most of us are here. And uh, I have a very, very nice group of colleagues here. So when we wish to start the engine, we need to start the blowers. And the second thing we need to do it is to pre-lube all the cylinders with cylinder oil. Okay? So if we wish to do that, we are clicking on the prepare start. So when we are clicking on the prepare start, auxiliary blowers will go to running and the lubricators will flush just for a second for the loop and they will give 20 strokes of cylinder oil injected to each cylinder, 20 strokes. And this is done only with the prepare start. Then what we do also in the conventional engine, because the procedure is exactly the same, on MC engines we also need blowers and cylinder oil. So second step was part of the conventional engine, open indicator box and give uh, an air blow to the main engine. So, if we click down on the slow turn and we are just, and we just move telegraph ahead, then uh, unfortunately we don't have the speakers here. You will hear that uh, the engine it is uh, rotating once with air through the slow turning valve of the pneumatic system and any kind of leakage that is on the top of the crystal grounds will be out. Then we close indicator box, of course, for not losing the air, giving a, a handle to zero again. And finally, we click in auto, which means air and fuel, regular normal start, and we transfer control to the bridge. Since here we don't have a bridge connection, we are going to do this from the engine control room station. Sometimes it's always better. So, uh, after clicking in auto, we are giving whatever on our handle and you will see that uh, the stabilizing speed for thermal protection of the engine it is 38.5 revolutions. So system will first stabilize, system will first stabilize, stabilizing speed through the interface units which are checking our command if it is safe and then it will run up. Tell me that it was easy. Okay, now I'm going to stop the engine and uh, I want first a lady to start the engine. Yeah, let's try it.
One thing before we go, it is uh, please do not go. Stay and ask questions. It is a fantastic opportunity, whatever the question is, to live with an answer. Thank you very much. So, uh,